Hi everyone, um, just to echo Charlotte, welcome to the Feminist Urbanism Expo and thanks for uh, joining us. Um, my background is in architecture and urban planning um, and I currently work for an architectural practice um, and outside of work I'm conducting research into femme, so female and queer design and engagement and how this can be facilitated within historic environments. Um, around a year ago I helped organise the event what does a feminist city look like? During which we explored different ideas uh, in feminist urbanism, including community empowerment, participation, and female led design. Um, the event was a really lovely discussion and introduction to the subject, and we were eager to continue this into a further series following the increased dialogue globally around women within construction uh, and public space and women's safety in general. Uh, this Feminist Urbanism Expo is the first event in the 2022 series that we're conducting, uh, offering the opportunity for young urbanists to share the work that they've been doing at university, in practice or in their own time. We will be starting with COVA um, with a short Q&A afterwards, as COVA's internet is a little bit unreliable at the moment. Um, and then after that, we'll have pre presentations from each speaker and a Q&A discussion at the end. Um, as Charlotte said, yeah, just ask any questions in the chat as and when they arise, um, and we'll kind of have a, a bigger discussion at the end. So yeah, I think we'll just go for it. And I'll start going down to Kova if she's ready. Okay. I am ready. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Kova Sevilla. I am a project and policy officer at the Town and Country Planning Association. And over five, ten minutes, I'm going to give you of the TCPA's publication titled The Forgotten Pioneers. Um, and in this publication, we essentially explore um, the role of women in the Garden City movement and New, new Towns movement. Uh, next slide, please. Great. Uh, for some reason, the titles are not appearing on these slides, but it's fine. Uh, everything will be fairly self-explanatory. Um, so probably when you picture the pioneers of the Garden City movement, which emerged in the late 19th century, probably this image uh, springs to mind. Um, just a bunch of white bearded old uh, men. Um, but essentially what we found researching this publication is that women had the substantial influence in the Garden City and New Towns movement. Um, this research is uh, it's far um, from, from an attempt to record the detailed history in planning and the um, sort of urbanism, women in urbanism in general. It is just the celebration of some of the women that contribute to the Garden City movement, but it's just sort of um, a start and a flavor. And we, we want to keep on exploring and continue celebrating the women in the whole uh, sector overall. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, oh, there's there's a few bits missing, but that's fine. Um, that is okay. Uh, um, so um, the, the, the Garden City movement emerged in the late 19th uh, century. Um, and this was a time of intense societal change. Um, so at the late 19th century, there was the loosening of Victorian rigidity uh, during a rise of utopian visions of a new society and the consolidation of the women's suffrage movement um, that the Garden City idea was developed by its founder, uh, Ebenezer Howard. Um, but the role of women city vision was complex. Um, so Ebenezer Howard nursed the idea of experimenting with new forms of social organization in the home um, based on cooperative principles with common gardens and uh, cooperative kitchens. So the idea is that the home caring tasks uh, would be shared among the residents of the garden cities. Um, this was quite a visionary perspective, um, you know, in the early 1900s of how the home would be organized. Um, and some historians, though, do argue that the sharing of these tasks uh, has had less to do with the emancipation of women from traditional roles in the home, uh, rather removing the reliance on, on servants at day. But it, it was still helping women becoming more, more independent um, from the, the house duties. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, but I mean, it, it's a shame because there are some, some quotes missing, but it's fine, it's, it's not substantial. But um, there were um, other considerations of women being part of the movement from the start. So the cover that you see here is from a book called Tomorrow, uh, which is the book that gave rise to the Garden City movement in which Ebenezer Howard um, shares uh, and, and essentially writes up what a Garden City uh, should be like. But um, he also mentions in this book um, that men or women could be elected to the board of management for the Garden City. Um, and essentially he described that women could could just have access to membership and therefore uh, have access to more um, managerial roles. And this is quite a discreet reference, um, but uh, it is more radical than it appears uh, as this level of equal rights was quite progressive at the time. Um, so tomorrow was published in 1898. Um, but if you think about the, the, you know, the rights of women back then, they, they were quite limited and it was not until 1918 um that 20 years after the publication of tomorrow that women had the same right uh, that women over 30 had the same right that had the right to parliamentary vote and it was not until 30 years later uh before that women had the rights in the same terms as 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 men um so equal access to the membership of the garden city association just meant that women could be part of the council uh, which actually provided women with an opportunity to, to have a say in the evolu evolution and consolidation of the movement. So we consider it quite a sort of big win in that aspect. Next slide, please. And um, in 1903, um, the first Garden City Letchworth uh, got founded. Um, and it was at a time of increasing political concerns for women's rights. And this was a really key subject uh, in Letchworth uh, and, and the citizens in Letchworth, uh, which, had tended, which tended to have advanced view generally on how to, um, on, la on life generally, uh, were also particularly forward looking on, on women votes and women's rights. And a few examples of this is that cycle works were incorporated in the original plans. Uh, we argue that it was particularly favorable for a liberal woman to be independent. Uh, and many famous suffragettes and inspiring women lived and worked and, and spoke at Letchworth um, and the whole town essentially supported votes for women. So right from the start of the idea, very much uh, a key topic. Um, next slide, please. Um, the same year um, Letchworth Garden City got founded in 1903, um, the Garden City Association Women's League was formed by Viscountess Muriel Hansley. Um, the group was open to members at no extra cost and promoted the aim of the association, uh, more especially in regard to the claims of the home from the point of views of mothers. Uh, but for example, the League encouraged a uh, woman to spread the Garden City idea within their networks, uh, just to secure shareholders. So once again, there's clearly a sign the association from the very early days wanted to involve women in their, in their key actions and activities. Next slide, please. And then as part of this, um, I just want to uh, highlight a few profiles that were particularly important at the time. Uh, the first one, the first image that you can see on the left is Lizzie Howard. Uh, she was Ebenezer Howard's first wife. And just to disclaim, I think it's terrible to describe someone, but the first thing that you say is that it was someone. Uh, but it also symbolizes her important role uh, in the organization and in promoting the movement. Uh, she was keen hosting events um, and, and promoting activities, and she secured a £50 gift from a wealthy supporter to assist in the publication of Tomorrow. Tomorrow was such a substantial book. It is, you know, good to think that uh, she was a, a key player in making that happen. Um, a second particularly important uh, influential figure at the time uh, that was part of the movement was Henrietta Barnett. Uh, she was the founder of the Hampstead Garden Suburb in 1904, and the Hampstead Garden Suburb incorporated mixed housing provision with schools, sculpture facilities, and education centre, which is once again really forward looking at the time, and she was a key figure in making that happen. Um, and lastly, probably the person that most of you recognise, um, Octavia Hill. Um, 
and was also a key uh, influential figure in the Garden City movement and, as you probably know, in the planning system or, overall. Um, her work as the first female housing property manager um, and in training other women was widely celebrated by people in the Garden City movement and inspired much of the work of the uh, women's section uh, through her work in the housing management system, something that I'll discuss in a second. Uh, next slide, please. And then um, forward in, in a sort of chronological order, uh, with, we're fast forwarding to the end of the First World War. Um, as you all probably know, uh, Britain's major cities were severely overcrowded and there was a huge need for working class housing. Uh, at, and at the same time, attitudes to where women were becoming, um, you know, were, were, were rapidly changing and the suffrage movement high. Um, and, and at the same time, there was an increased involvement of local authorities in supplying uh, housing, uh, which often led to an increase in partnership with the voluntary housing sector, which was essentially dominated by women's organizations and provided a new avenue for participation. Um, and a huge range of, of women-led organizations uh, emerged in that era, including forms, groups formed within the Garden City Movement. Next slide, please. And that's when the women's section of the Garden City and Town Planning Association was founded in May 1920 uh, as an outcome of a conference of women's organizations. Uh, the women's section uh, campaigned on a variety of matters, such as the improvement of sanitary conditions in rural areas, and inspired by Octavia Hill, focused on, on involving women as housing managers. Um, then it, it's quite interesting because one outcome of the women's section um, was of an organization that's called Women's Pioneer Housing. Uh, this is, uh, and I think it's the only woman only housing association uh, which still exists nowadays. And the group celebrated uh, their centenary in October, 2020. Um, so it, it, it still resonates nowadays, um, all these um, ideas that got developed back in the day. Next slide, please. And now I'm um, sort of continuing in the in the uh, you know in the continuation of the key moments in the planning um, system, um, and uh, you know the post World War II experience of strategic planning. Uh, there was a clear need for large scale war um, reconstruction, uh, which led to the New Towns Act of 1946, uh, and there were radical changes in the plan. Um, uh, the, the post-war area uh, continued to support changes on the perspectives of women and employment, um, and as the reconstruction effort made the need for an expanded labor force. Um, once again, women did play an, an important role in delivering the new towns built under the new act. Um, and um, yeah, and there were some key uh, influential women in the in the different boards uh, of the new town development corporations and in key positions. Next slide, please. Um, and these are three fantastic women, actually. Um, the first one is uh, Monica Felton, uh, and she was the only woman on the Reef Committee. So the Reef Committee was the committee that decided to make new towns happen, and she was the only woman there. Um, and she was the chair of the development corporation for the first designated new town, Stevenage. Uh, she's an incredibly interesting figure. Um, the second person I'd like to highlight is Elizabeth Mitchell, uh, and she was key in promoting new towns in Scotland. Uh, she was, yeah, she was crucial in, in planning the Scottish new towns uh, and also served in the East Kilbride. Of the Hey there, I think your internet might have gone a little bit. It might be worth turning off the camera. Unfortunately, I think Cove has fallen victim to her um, internet um, in her hotel room. Um, but I think we were almost at the end of that presentation. Kirsty? Yeah, we were. Um, 
there was a the last couple of slides. So if she joins back in the next couple of minutes, we can maybe um, continue it. But if not, then we can just move straight on. We can. And um, just for everybody, I have put in the chat a link to Cova's um, report that she's done via the Town and Country Planning Association and also uh, one of the quotes that's quite important from that. Um, so it's a it's a short but really interesting um, read, actually. And the TCPA has a wider archive with lots more amazing women within it that have yet to be researched. Um, so it's Great. really a fabulous report. Charlotte, that was that was perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I think I'm back. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure Charlotte completed what uh, you probably missed out from what I said, but it was essentially the end of the uh, presentation. If you, you should be able to find out um, how you can access the publication, but it's worth a read. Uh, if you know of any more people that we should highlight, get in contact with me. I want an opportunity to write a second paper um, on the topic. So uh, that's pretty much it. Sorry for the slight technical issue. No, that was great. Um, I'm not sure, Charlotte, if anyone sent any messages in the chat of questions. Um, um, no, but I'd had one myself. Um, it's really interesting that there was a women's league and a women's section. Um, do you think that we need to bring these sorts of organisations back? I think we may have lost Cover again. Yeah, I think you might be right. OK, I think if we maybe just move on um, to Prem, if they're ready, and then we can always come back, uh, or she might be able to rejoin in at the end for the QA. Yep, uh, ready whenever. Amazing. Okay. Right, that's you. Uh, yep. Yeah, cool. Um, I'm going to start now. Hi, everyone. So, my name is Prem, and I'm an architectural graduate from the Manchester School of Architecture. And I'm here to briefly narrate my year long thesis project entitled Ether, which is Counteract in Tamil. Next, please. So, Ether was proposed as an architectural intervention in response to the increased discrimination faced by the South Indian community in Malaysia. This was based on the premise of policies and politics that has mismanaged equal opportunities by favoring one community over the other. Um, it has been seen pre-independence with colonial oppression and post-independence with Bumi Putra rights, or known as Article 153, that was introduced to solely serve the Malay community. Next, please. Um, the South Indian community in Malaysia has faced unprecedented hardship ranging from rental discrimination to high rates of police brutality. According to Malaysia Kini, the official figures showed that 23.4% of Indians are victim of police custodial death. However, a real percentage is projected to be as high as 54.8%. Next. Um, Historically, lives of Indians have changed in Penang. Captain Francis Light of the British East India Company first brought Indians as indentured labor to Esplanade. Indentured labor is another way to say slavery. And Esplanade is the chosen site of this project. So the field was used to segregate Indians into an occupation most fit for them. Either they were segregated to plantation worker or a sepoy soldier, which is the picture that you see on your left. Uh, the picture on your right is what Esplanade is today, which is the center of a designated UNESCO heritage zone and is used as a place for tourism that celebrates events, festivals, and the arts. Next. Um, with the current policies in place, I realized that there is a need for open dialogue as fear-driven tactics have gotten the better of this community. Um, it is important that South Indians are allowed to express without fear of judgment through censorship laws that are currently put in place in Malaysia. Next, please. Um, this is the site. And my site, I coined the term an epicenter of conflict. Um, so the surrounding typologies introduce a huge colonial Chinese and a Malay presence 
but the lack of Indian presence reflects the forgotten Indian sacrifice that was once so significant to this field. Um, Ethere intends of rectifying these dissected elements, uh, sorry, Ethere intends of rectifying this problem by dissecting elements of architectural power, translocating these pieces onto site and reimagining them as safe spaces for South Indians today. Next, please. So the form of ethere uses lines, axes, and principles from multiple precedents whilst integrating traditional Indian technology. I utilize a 64 grid system that dictates and responds to the program, the site, and the dissected pieces of powers whilst combating the caste system that is partially to blame for present day colorism within Malaysia. Next, please. So looking at current and relevant Indian scales, a potential matrix of architectural languages, materials, and colors curate a palette that encompass Little India, the current residing area of Indians in Penang, and Tamil Nadu, the place of departure in India. This dictates the start of Indianfication, a word, another word I coined to implement Indian curated strategies to a building, a site, or in this case, a program. Next, please. By using Anthropocene feminism, which is harnessing the current conditions of the site, in this case, the sea tides are used to change the quality of the spaces altogether. Um, on your left, you'll see how the sea tides do that. So for example, during low tide, the site is fully exposed. During average tide, the middle of the site called the Brahma gets filled with water and the floor plate kind of shrinks. Uh, during high tide, the ground floor is completely submerged, forcing users to enter the spaces of dissected power or to flee the site entirely. Next. So now that I've covered the basis of the form development behind it, I would like to share the journey. So Ether is narrated through a journey, one of an Indian, one of an Indian that begins in Little India. The protagonist makes their way through the city and ends up at the site, which the user will then explore places of protest, Brahma, compassion, access, debate, and the arrival consecutively. Next. So we begin at the place of protest, which is designed to overcome the unfeminist nature of the site, where there is a lack in opportunity for the freedom of speech. Um, Speaker's Corner Penang was established model on Hyde Park on this site to allow members of the public to speak. Although this showed very great promise, there's a huge billboard on the, on the field that has a rule that says, the Penang State Government and the Penang Island City Council are not responsible for any prosecution or legal action taken by the Royal Malaysian Police, uh, indicating a very hostile environment for any user. Next. Um, we then approach the Brahma. So Ethir's Brahma is a modern interpretation of a temple tank by using design principles of, of a traditional Brahma. As the center is dedicated to Brahma, the Lord of Speech, the temple tank serves as a social space where users congregate and disperse when need be. Uh, the center sees the big shifts with the tides. Thus, the environment constantly involves making users unaware of the scenario they may land up in. Next, please. The Brahma is based on similar design aims as traditional Dravidian Brahmas as seen in Vastu Shastra. The aims are to integrate architecture with nature, in this case, the sea, the relative function of various parts of the structure, in this case, the dissected pieces of power, ancient beliefs utilizing geometric patterns, in this case, the 64 grid that I mentioned, and a directional element alignment, which is the axis that I will get to. Next. From the center, we then move on to the place of compassion, which was introduced to encourage participation within the existing users of the site with the actors of anger. Uh, the human library is based on the notion where topics concerning the discrimination of South Indians as a minority are discussed openly between the actors of anger as human books, and the users of their site would be their readers. So by using one's experience as content for con conversation, the actors of anger are able to challenge stigmas and stereotypes that revolve around the South Indian community as a whole. Next. As I mentioned before, there is a directional element, which is the axis, which is shown on the screen. So the axis signifies the remembrance of all fallen victims within the South Indian community from unjust police brutality 
brutality, uh, court in steel with engravings of names of those who have passed in both Tamil and English are seen when ascending within the axis, inside and on its outer facade. The axis is a bridge of reflection where the journey resembles Indian hilltop temples through never ending stairs till one finally reaches the top. Next. Um, this is the place of debate and the place of debate is designed to affirm and remind users about the misgivings that South Indians have been through past and present. Um, by allowing the intended vocalization within users, the place of debate enables open dialogue, uh, thus resulting in the opportunity for debate. That's thus a place for debate. Um, I've had many conversations with people and some, uh, a lot of people find this an aggressive method and I say yes, it is aggressive, but we do need to realize that creating managed conflict can actually coexist within space and it could create fertile ground for innovation. Um, to remind the misgivings of the past and the present, um, we remind ourselves with Captain Francis Light. We have a Captain Francis Light statue who brought Indians and he's being currently drowned in the water. Sorry, it's just one of my favorite things I had to point out. Um, next. So, through the spaces I have mentioned, it was crucial to detail the threshold towards an Indian user. Uh, visual connections from indoor to outdoor spaces and choice of materi materiality that is commonly seen in Penang allows for the amplification of Indianfication. It, these thresholds are meant to remind, to guide, to familiarize users when experiencing a fear. Next. Um, the floating pier reaches out into the sea, signifying a docking point for those on arrival. The pier acts as a social space, one that contemplates the injustice that is constantly repeated in present. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, we reach the arrival point, uh, where it's the symbol of new beginnings for the South Indian community. The tallest point on the site, the Gopuram, acts as a landmark that commemorates the Indian sacrifice that is now returned and shall remain. Next. And that's all I've prepared. Thanks for listening. And if, I'll be happy to answer any questions later on. Amazing. I think um, the next person is Kat, if I'm correct in that. Um, and she's just going to share herself. So I'll just give her a minute to get set up. But that was great, Prem. Thank you. Again, any questions or anything, feel free to put them in the chat. Is that working okay for everyone? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Kat Ennis. Um, so this presentation is about the master's thesis I did last summer um, at Harriet Watt University in Urban and Regional Planning. Um, so the title of my thesis was Leaf Edinburgh Towards a 20-Minute Neighbourhood, Exploring Residence Requirement and Implementing the 20-Minute Neighbourhood Concept in Leaf, with a focus on the needs of women specifically. Um, so I'll just start with what is a 20 minute neighborhood. Um, I'm not gonna read through this whole paragraph, don't worry. Um, so this, so basically the 20 minute neighborhood initially started out as 50 minute city idea designed by Carlos Marino in 2016. Um, and it's later evolved into 20 minute neighborhoods as research farmers is the furthest distance that people will be willing to walk to meet their daily needs. Um, and the concept surrounds the idea that if people manage to meet their daily needs within their neighbourhood, then it will create a more sustainable city to live in, towns and such forth. Um, so the premise of my thesis was basically that it's all very well and good that people can meet their needs within their neighbourhood and that they have the services and the amenities required to do this. However, if their access to where they're trying to go for these services um, isn't available or they feel too vulnerable, particularly with the case of women, that the like, concept may fail. Um, so the aims and objectives was to, um, it seems like it's kind of a, yeah, I can see by now. Um, so I wanted to highlight a gap in existing research 
and policy and sort of Maori research that's linked to the 20 minute neighborhoods, such as active travel, environmental determinism, violence against women, perceptions of vulnerability, all under one particular umbrella. Um, and I want to, I chose to investigate this in LEAF, which I'll get onto by site later. Um, and I wanted to invest whether residents, what residents, particularly women, would like to see within their neighborhood and things that they need, which aren't there maybe, or things that could be changed. And I wanted to look at whether social interventions could help them feel safe and less vulnerable within their neighborhoods. And um, I also spoke to charities and pressure groups and policymakers um, about the issues and just to see what could be done. Um, so basically the idea of my thesis was to have a little bit more public participation with women and see what they actually needed and what's actually there and whether they're being listened to. Um, so the research design was, uh, of course, with a literature review and I investigated secondary data concepts. Um, and then from that, I went on to do an online survey with a combination of open, closed, and multiple choice questions. And then from that, the people that were willing to leave me with their details, I contacted them about anonymized, semi structured follow up interviews. And I wanted to keep these anonymous so that people are willing to be more open. So I just sort of labeled people like A, B, and C when I published. Um, and then meetings with agencies and local authorities to discuss my findings. And um, so my case study area was in Leaf, which is partially because I used to live there and I know that neighborhood well. Um, but basically it's because historically it was separated from Edinburgh, which therefore meant that it's actually got a lot of its own services, amenities, its own like separate sort of culture and um, parks and so forth. So it's almost there, it just could be improved a little more, you know. Um, and also due to a wealth of existing research relating to fields of um, female vulnerability and um, those things like articles published by the UN, the Feminist Census, um, Fitzgerald and so forth, and also recent violent attacks. And at the time I did mine, as I'm sure you remember the Sarah Everett crisis, which was very eye-opening and it did make people really reconsider how safe they are and where they live. Um, and that's also my own age group, so I felt like it's relevant to me and my friends. Um, so here's just a few little quotes here that I'm not going to read out to you, as I'm sure you can see them yourselves. Linking to female safety. Um, I do want to highlight here that Scotland's aligned itself with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And one of those is to make cities and all human settlements safe, inclusive, resilient and sustainable. And that to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. And I'm basically questioning whether it's actually signing up to what it's actually agreed to. Um, and then there's just this one here from the United Nations, which has been published everywhere. So I'm sure a lot of you have already seen it. That 86% of women aged 18 to 24 do feel unsafe in public spaces. And 71% of women of any age have experienced sexual harassment. And from the European Social Survey, 32% of British women do feel unsafe walking at night time compared to just 13% of men. Um, okay, so the results, the survey. Um, so that table on the left there is just a rundown of who took my survey. Um, and as you can see, like a large majority of the people that did it were within my target age of 18 to 35 year old females. However, there's a lot of people that fell outside of that group, which made the question whether it is indeed a wider problem affecting all women and even some men. Um, so, in the neighbourhood. So this chart just quickly shows in relation to the 20 minute neighbourhood just what distances people would be willing to walk. And um, I think it's actually a broader amount than just the 20 minute region, which suggests maybe it should be renamed living more locally rather than focusing on the distance that people are living from these services. Um, and again, I just asked to confirm that people did consider Leaf did consider leave their neighbourhood as a whole as it has actually a bit of a large area in the 20 minute radius but it has its own separate identity and people could identify that as their neighbourhood. Um, so in terms of the services and amenities that are already there, when I did ask people like in just a yes or no format whether they were happy with the services and amenities, um, most people did actually say yes as you can see there in the orange. Um, and when I asked the places people to spend time socially outdoors or indoors, a lot of people did say yes. However, when I moved on to open question format, and I asked people like, actually what are they missing or what would they like to see more of, um, people came up with all sorts of things and I thematically analyzed this and just put it into a table there. And I just want to highlight one of these, um, toilets. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that 
toilets in public places are actually a largely a female issue and there isn't enough female toilets, especially when you consider the fact there's such a pregnancy and menstruation and small bladders and such like. Um, I think this is something that like women will not go to parks and things and sit there for too long if they need the toilet and they have to go home, which makes it feel like these areas aren't as accessible to women as men. Um, in terms of community, the things that people came up with seem to be like those key themes and I think it highlights a need for people wanting to like come together and have like a community feel and to get to know their neighbours and I think often people feel safer when there are events on there for the streets are busier, the parks are busier and so forth. Um, and there was also a key one for exercise, I think my dog is barking, if you just ignore it. Um, but exercise classes and things that could be done, like, you know, like female running groups and things with, in terms of safety by numbers. Um, they looked at barriers to active travel in leaf neighbourhood, and I asked people like, if they felt like there was, they have, like didn't walk or didn't cycle because they felt like areas were inaccessible and services were inaccessible or they felt vulnerable. And as you can see, a large majority of people that said yes were women. Um, so then I asked people specifically like what specific streets, and as you can see that table is pretty huge um, from the map there, it does actually cover quite a huge amount of red crosses. And I just want to point out Great Junction Street here and Leaf Walk, which have the highest numbers, are actually either accesses to services or places where a lot of services and amenities are focused, which kind of pinpoints my idea. And I also asked people what time of day they felt unsafe and it tended to be nighttime. Um, so then this is just a table where I did a multiple choice questions of reasons that people feel unsafe or less likely to go out at night time and so forth. Um, and a lot of them are things that can actually be solved by physical changes, like better lighting, better underpasses, less blind corners, cut hedges. And I think these are issues that planners and policymakers can actually quite easily address and make the 20 minute neighborhood concept more accessible towards women. Um, then, as I said before, I looked at social interventions that people may, like, in combination with the physical interventions to make them feel safer. Um, things that came up were like, as you can see there, like leaf-wide anti-harassment and violence campaigns, better consent and sexuality teaching within schools and workplaces, um, group exercise clubs, and as you can see, the higher to the better police presence. And I just want to highlight one of them. So an app for personal safety, I also discussed a lot in my interviews with people and there's this one here from Delhi. And it's basically like, you can highlight areas where you might feel unsafe and you can rate areas and explain why on the app. And then this can then be fed back into the design processes. And I think this would be a way for like anonymous reporting for women or like rather than going towards the council, the police, it's like an easy way that you can come forward from your phone and say, I felt safe in this area. And it's also, you can track your friends and such like, like the apps that do already exist. Um, and then I just invited a little bit of independent thinking of what's the one thing you would like to change in me. Um, and as you can see, safety for women and litter came up as the higher ones. And there was actually a lot of discussion I had with people where litter and dirty streets kind of creates a sort of eerie feeling. And if that was better cleaned up, like a lot of it's not just to do with whether a street is unsafe, it's to do with whether it's perceived as unsafe, it's just as likely going to stop someone from walking or cycling to meet their daily needs locally. Um, and this one was really important. It was just if these issues were better considered by planners and policymakers, would they be more likely to walk and cycle? And the answer was yes. And obviously, walking and cycling and feeling safe will include your well being when living in the area as well and create less pollution and so forth. Um, so, in terms of my interviews, I'm not going to go into too much depth about this because half of it sort of already covered. Um, but people did share their own personal experience of sexual harassment, some sexual violence and inaccessibility in leaf that was very much in line with the UN's findings and suggested a clear desire for safer streets, more community events, lots of ideas about better lit parks, better lit certain areas. And um, social interventions came up very popular and we discussed this at length of like people's different experiences. They like consent teaching at schools. So I know for me, it was not an awful lot of that when I was younger. Um, and there was the key pattern that people would like to walk, cycle and exercise outside a lot more, but felt like they couldn't. And if you're going to introduce better services and better amenities to leave, you need to make sure they're accessible, just like pedestrian zones are pointless if you can't access that pedestrian zone after dark. 
Um, so moving on to in, um, interviews with charities and policymakers. Um, I'm just going to let you guys read some of this while I speak. Um, so with the Women's Budget Group, uh, Ian Gishman, and um, the Community Council and Elliot Puma UK, we had very interesting discussions where they agreed with what I was saying and what the relevant research is and how it needs to be triangulated all under one umbrella to create more holistic neighbourhoods um, and more holistic integrated planning across sectors. Um, but I just want to highlight that like Edinburgh City Council that I emailed several times, this obviously during the pandemic, so I wasn't able to meet with anyone in person. Um, but even just a phone call or something, they just seem to be bounced between departments. Um, and either that could be due to the constraints of the pandemic, and I know a lot of people are extending their houses and blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, it just felt a bit like they didn't really want to speak with me. And I don't know if I was bounced between departments, and that does show poor integration between like things like active travel, female safety, and such like. And likewise, within my literature reviews, I found articles by the Scottish Government about female safety and perceptions of safety and things. Yet there was little reflection of this in Edinburgh's like, action plans for active travel and so forth. Although it was mentioned in some of the briefing notes for 20 minute neighbourhoods. Um, so hopefully we're moving towards a little bit more structural change there. Um, so just my conclusions. Um, it's crucial that when 20 minute neighbourhoods in the are introduced that there's spaces that do have multiple uses for everyone and they do consider more people and that women are better considered within planning, whether that's through public engagement or whether that is through more women in policy positions. Um, and I thought maybe a briefing note on gender mainstreaming and just making like gender mainstreaming is the idea of more gender equality regarding 20 minute neighbourhoods, I think that should be published and become government policy if these are going to be implemented all over the country, not just Scotland, but all across the UK. And I think equality impact assessment should be, would be really useful as well for this. Um, there's also Atkins report, Getting Home Safely, which I'm happy to send you these links if anyone's interested in reading them. Um, and it advocates, this one advocates a safe by design. And it also provides a toolkit for how to do this. And it's basically the idea that women shouldn't have to change their behaviour. And they do have a right to the city and they should be able to access what they need to do. But the city around them should be designed, whether that's socially or whether that is through physical changes like better lighting and so forth. And just one last slide here. Um, so this is just a quick summary. So I believe that if you're going to implement a 20 minute neighbourhood and think of the needs of women, it's physical changes such as like the streets, parks, lower hedges. Um, social changes, better policing, and so forth. Um, spaces which reflect and consider the needs of multiple people. So, for example, like a lot of sports grounds, it's like they have areas for like boys to play sports and things, but they don't really consider what girls need in those areas. Um, further open spaces and lighter parks that can be used after dark, the quality impact assessments. And yeah, just more female and vulnerable people targeted public engagement, whereas like these people who feel vulnerable are probably less likely to step forward. And I think you need to actively go out and seek them, which for me, to be fair, wasn't that hard. I just posted it on some Facebook groups and it was shared on Twitter and things. And it is easy to get hold of these people. And I think now women do want to speak about it. I think a lot of women have had enough now. Um, so yeah, that's me. I don't know how to stop sharing. Amazing. Thanks, Kat. Um, and I think... Oh, yeah, <laughs> no, you're absolutely grand. Um, and I think we've got Fionn is our last speaker. Um, and again, she's just going to share her screen. Great. Hi, everyone. Can everyone see this? Yeah. Fabulous, thank you. So yeah, thank you for having me. My name is Fionn Middleton. I am a planning consultant at Turley, which is a planning consultancy. Um, so this research is based on my undergraduate dissertation on women's safety and urban planning, and is also based on the sort of wider work I'm doing on gender focused planning within Turley in my role. So I'm going to start us off with a quote, uh, which sort of um, I use this quote when I present this to people in work to try and convey why we're talking about gendered perceptions and why gender comes into planning. Um, so it says that gendered perceptions of safety are one of many factors that impact how, where and when people travel in the city. 
as such urban mobility is gendered. The omission of gendered urban experiences in the way our cities are designed, planned and built disparately impacts women, jeopardises their safety and denies them of their right to the city. So obviously quite a strong quote saying about how it um, denies us of our right to the city, but I think it's really important to acknowledge this and it's great to see, you know, this kind of um, expo happening and it's clearly something that we're starting to think about. So in terms of women's safety and urban planning, evidence demonstrates that women and girls do not feel safe in our public spaces, with over 70% of women in the UK being sexually harassed in public spaces. Um, this has affected young women a little bit more, with only 3% of women aged 18 to 24 saying that they have not been sexually harassed. And it needs to be recognised that although violence and against women and girls is a societal issue, um, it's impacted by the built environment and that we can play a role in addressing some of these issues. There's also always an assumption of gender neutrality in planning where we don't really consider it um, and that's just sort of how it goes but we do find that um, this approach centres the man as the default um, and this is explained really well in Caroline Criado Perez's book Invisible Women uh, which argues that this isn't sort of intentional but there's a data gap in how women are perceived and men um, and just a general lack of understanding of the female experience. Um, yeah, so the design of our cities and public spaces is unintentionally gender biased. Uh, we don't mean to create spaces like this, but kind of like Kat has mentioned, things like public toilets, um, all kinds of things just make lives a bit more difficult for women. Um, and this perpetuates gender inequalities. Um, to clarify that, obviously cities don't produce gender based based violence, but they create situations that make women more vulnerable to violence and harassment due to poor design. For example, blind corners um, and all different kinds of underpasses and things that we see in our cities today, these uh, create situations that could be um, quite dangerous for women. Um, this research was all actually inspired by an alley by my house. Um, I live in quite a safe area, I perceive it to be safe anyway, um, but there's a horrible alley with one light and it's really long and there's like a kink in it and blind spots and it's just horrible so um obviously there's these spaces that are still in our cities today and evidence shows that women are less likely to use parks and paths after dark as well because of perceived danger and often men are a little bit more comfortable in the evenings um, this often relates to issues such as enclosure lack of surveillance and poor lighting although the list goes on um, and it must be noted, though, that if we are going to look at women's safety um, and women's issues, it should be an intersectional approach. And we need to realise that there are different aspects of our personalities and our identities, like our gender, age and race that interact to shape how we are as people. So in my dissertation, I interviewed a range of planning consultants, uh, public sector planners, uh, designing out crime officers, urban designers, just lots of different people in the sector. I wanted to understand why we're not thinking about safety in general, let alone female safety, uh, and what we think we can do in the planning system to get this um, started. Obviously, I don't know, some of you might have seen that there's been a bill that's been uh, um, introduced recently about including like a gender assessment um, as a condition on a planning um, application, which is very interesting. And obviously it's something that's starting to be considered. So the main recommendation given um, through my interviews for my dissertation was that we need stronger, more specific planning policy. Um, in planning, if the policy is not there, uh, we're not, you know, it's not something that has grounds to be considered. So we need to ensure that national, regional and local policies are there to ensure safety, that they are specific and that they're aligned across different regions. Education, education is a huge factor. Um, I know personally from my own planning education that I haven't had nothing to do with gender or anything just about people's varying perceptions of public spaces. And this is something that's really important, not only at a university level, but also at a school level. Um, and also when we come to the workplace, for example, with CPD sessions, we need to make sure that when we are consulting, whether that's through like a pre-application process or something like that, we need to make sure that it's meaningful and that we're really trying to reach those hard to reach communities and women, of course. Uh, this can be done through things like safety audits and really engaging with the community, and that could be so beneficial in the long term. Um, obviously, there's a lack of resources, such as lack of urban designers and designing out crime officers in councils, 
And this is something that should obviously be addressed in the long term, but it's difficult due to cuts in budgets. Um, planning committee was also flagged as an issue in my interviews. Lots of uh, public sector planners were actually expressing that even if they do have comments about design and they are maybe thinking of a gendered perspective and how a place might be unsafe, that's never represented at committee. And they find that sometimes their comments are filtered through. So I think we need to obviously, I don't know how you'd go about that, but we need to make sure that those comments are fairly presented. Female influence is obviously a huge issue that's widely spoken about, not only in planning, just in the built environment sector. Uh, we need more representation of females, not only in any roles, but in higher roles as well. Um, there used to be a women's design service, um, and it would be great to see something like that reinstated um, to have some more female representation and a task force to be there to sort of um, talk about these issues. Gender mainstreaming is sort of the long term goal of this and essentially what that would entail is making sure that gender is mainstreamed across all services, making sure that we're considering gender in policies, applications and systems. Um, and this then in turn makes sure that lots of other vulnerable groups are considered um, because evidence shows that if you create a space for women, it's beneficial to lots of other people, such as the elderly and children. And the RTPI actually just had a recent study that shows that gender is not being effectively mainstreamed into the planning system, despite the fact that they actually published a gender mainstreaming toolkit in, I think it was 2002 or 2003. Um, and of course, research. We need more research on this, which is why it's great that we're having these discussions today. We need to understand um, how we can bring not only safety, but also gender perspective, perspectives back into the planning system. Um, yeah, and that's everything I have. So thank you. Amazing. Thanks. Um, I think we've had a few questions. Um, Charlotte, I'm not sure if you want to read some out. Um, yes, I'll have a look now. Um, first of all, is everybody okay to share their presentations? I'm assuming that's that's okay from all speakers. Um, Kat, we've just got like a, a one for you that says, has your research been published yet? Oh yeah, I was just replying to that. No, I haven't published it. I just did it as my university dissertation. Probably no hard to do that. I'd love to if someone had a platform for that. Um, does it not get published by the university? Possibly. Know. It's worth asking. Usually they put dissertations out on libraries and stuff like that. Um, but if you've got it, you've got it as a PDF, so we can all, we can always share it. Yeah, that's um, I can't see any additional uh, questions at the moment, but I think what we were going to say, people, what, what's usually quite nice about Young Urbanist events is we have a bit more of a discussion. So if anybody just wants to put their hand up and ask something or raise it, or it doesn't need to be a question, it could be a comment or just something that you wish to discuss with the presenters today. If not, we, Kirsty, I know, has a couple of questions. Do you want to go kick off with yours, Kirsty? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Um, I'm not sure. I'll start with Prem, um, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's um, I just wondered, um, coming kind of, what I took away from your presentation is that there were certain aspects of it that you emphasized how um, people feeling heard within a uh, space, within um, kind of policy frameworks, et cetera, um, are really important in terms of your design. And I wondered if this was an approach that you also thought would be applicable within the UK from your experience here. Um, and if you thought it would translate in a similar way or if it would be very different. Sure. So, um... In one of my um, one of my lectures or courses, we even did a comparison of architects. So I decided to do a uh, comparison of like the different architecture boards 
uh, within the UK and within Malaysia just to see. So I looked at gender discrimination between the both of, of the boards and I also looked at racism between both the boards. And um, I do feel that uh, the UK is going in the right direction in terms of having like, um, well, I don't know if they're really trying to close the gender pay gap fast enough. I think it just needs to happen now and now. Um, it is definitely happening a bit happening a bit more faster than um, Malaysia, that's for sure. Um, in terms of racial discrimination, like June June theme, oh my God, it's such a tongue twister. That's a thing that's being celebrated, which I think that's great. Um, yeah, so there is that battle between uh, the policies. It's just that um, there are policies in place in Malaysia which make it a bit more difficult for which make it, how do I put this delicately? So Malaysia has been um, present, has been advertised as this very racial harmonious country that all the communities live under this one umbrella and we all live in this happy rainbow days. Um, that's how tourism has sold itself. And I think if you really take the people out of the government and out of their political views, and that is so true, but how racial, how Malaysia um, happened in terms of politics is that it was all racial politics to begin with. So even our parties are very much, this is the Malay demographic party, this is the Chinese demographic party, this is the Indian demographic party. And when you have that, that's already happening within the big board parties, that's going to trickle down to all the small parties, I feel. And then that's when all these like um, discriminated factors kind of happen. Um, so yeah, South Indians, so just as a little um, population, South Indians only make up for 7% of the national population. So they, we are a very small demographic, um, but as I said, we make up for 50% of police brutality rates, um, which if you really think about it, the proportion is just way off. Um, so whether that can be translated, I think, if you really look at it, it really translates to the BLM movement. Um, if I can really compare it, if I can really say, um, if I'm giving you an international precedent of how uh, colorism has affected Malaysia, it's the BLM movement, it's police brutality, it's rental discrimination, it's districts uh, segregating one district to another. So I'm not sure if that really answers your question. I think that, yeah, I think kind of what, you've implied is that there's a lot of things that uh, translate between the two um kind of regardless of specifics in terms of political landscapes yeah just Kirsty, um we do have a, a question from the chat so sandra woodall who is an aru member um says great presentation thank you are there any example of women friendly urban areas that can demonstrate good practice? So um, who do we want to go to first, Kirsty? Fionn? Yeah, Fionn, anything? Um, yeah, I don't know of any in the UK. I'm actually just starting my uh, master's dissertation now on um, sort of Vienna and the sort of approach they've taken there. And from my understanding and my initial research, they're sort of a world leader in uh, female friendly spaces. I know that they've done quite a few pilot projects where they've taken a project that needs to be done and they've made it completely female orientated, done by females for females. Um, interestingly, from a political strategic communications perspective, they've um, kept that secret until the uh, development has finished. So they've sort of kept the female side of it away obviously because sometimes that causes issues um but yeah I know of probably like 60 pilot projects in Vienna where they've been centered around creating a female friendly environment um so that's actually a piece of research that I'm looking <laughs> to do now so I don't know too much about it but I know that there are really good European international um examples of these female spaces um, and make space for girls on sort of a smaller level are a great example of how you make actual spaces for women um, and public parks and things like that so we do have some things in the UK but yeah I think we need to do some more research on that at the moment. Yeah I mean although it's not a um, specific kind of urban area intervention it's more 
architecture. Um, the last event that we did kind of in the feminist urbanism series had the East End Women's Museum. Um, one of the architects, two of the architects from that project. And there uh, it's the first kind of women centered museum in the UK um, women design team and women builders which is really interesting. And um, so they've kind of incorporated a lot of almost gender mainstreaming techniques, but community engagement techniques as well. Um, and probably kind of relate also to things like incorporation of women within uh, construction in general and their kind of interpretation of what design should be. Um, so that's probably quite a good example if you're looking for one. Kat or Pram, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I was, I would have said the end as well. I'm actually just trying to. Yeah, unfortunately, the I, unfortunately, I'm looking. I'm trying to think of any Asian country, and it's very sad to say that I can't think of any on the top of my head. Unfortunately. Yeah. It. it it's. A, it's a developing space. Um. So there is a. Um chapter that I helped write with um, some other women from uh, across, um, across the academic sphere, where we do highlight some of these um, different um, case studies and things. So I will try and see if it's still open source and I can share it. Um, but I played a very minor role about some stuff in the UK. But there's quite, there is quite a lot of international practice. I think there's possibly some good stuff happening in South America. Um, in in Leeds, actually, they're trying to be the first ever women friendly city in England and the UK. It doesn't seem to be translating into planning at the moment or regeneration or the built environment necessarily. There's other sort of interventions and policies. But I did do a big plea when there was um, the UK, uh, what was it, Real Estate Infrastructure Investment Forum, and I spoke on a panel for the City Council, that they need to include planning, urbanism, architecture, built environment within that. And there's a there's a real big opportunity. So I'm hoping that they were listening um, because they seem to have quite a lot of uh, backing for what they're um, doing. Um, Kirsty, there was somebody that's asked a really um, interesting, uh, well, they've given a really interesting comment and uh, and and sort of asking the panel's um, perspective on it. Anna, I wondered if you wanted to actually um, ask that yourself and and sort of open up a general discussion on what what you're saying. If we're if 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 you want to say that you are happy to be unmuted in the chat, then we 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 can do that. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Ah, yes, perfect. Okay, yeah, uh, I will just not turn on my camera because my connection is very bad. So as soon as I do that, I will get out. Um, so I'm a sociologist and I'm I'm working on the research for my master thesis on uh, gender in public space. I'm actually uh, studying the public space of Sao Paulo, the city in Brazil in connection with the transgender community and in relation with uh, public space and like how they build safe spaces in the city and how they face discrimination and how they try to find solution for it. My question is, since I understood that quite almost everybody here is from a background of urbanism or urban planning or architecture, my question is, uh, or my comment is about how can we uh, put together these different areas of research when they are interested in this similar topics because the, the examples you, you are talking about, about Vienna and about other cities, it's basically what I found also from a sociological perspective and knowing that sociologists often lack uh, the part about planning new uh, resources or a new project and from the point of architecture and urbanism there is a lack sometimes of the understanding of more complex social interactions how do you see uh, possibly uh, these two kind of, of perspective working together uh, yeah, that's it. Did 
Does anybody want to go first? You can answer if you want. Yeah, so, well, in terms of, I wouldn't say necessarily like sociology per se, because I wouldn't pretend to be an expert. However, like, do you see how I covered like social interventions that could be helpful? And I think the important thing you've got to remember about planning is that it is a touch to government. So what can happen like in terms of physical streets, it's also like if governments do integrate properly, this can filter into like education, it can filter into policing, like all sorts of social things that can come on top of just like the physical changes. I think it's a misconception that I think a lot of people actually have that planning is only about the way the street looks. But planning is also about like, it's spread across like horizontally integrated amongst like schools and things and all sorts of government departments and if that makes sense or helps you at all. Can I just add on to that? I think it would because when we talk about intervention for um, a safe space for women um, in particular. I think it also depends on the type of scale. So if you're looking at an urbanist point of view, you're talking at a really large scale, right? You're talking about like, you're talking about how to like manage districts. Where else if you're talking to an architect, you're probably, and especially, so yours especially was about trans people. Um, the first thing that comes to in mind for trans people, because I've had friends who are doing projects for trans people um, for Hijra communities in India and their main, con and his main concern was the toilet, the toilet. And that's something that Kat has mentioned in her presentation several times is that the toilet can be a very daunting space. And I think the gender politics of toilets. So if you're gonna ask me what my point of view is, is what is the first public intervention that needs to be really like thought of would be the thresholds of toilets and how to navigate the dangers of a toilet for a trans person, for a heteronormative person, for a non-binary person. And I think that itself explodes a whole can of worms. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, I would say as my point of view and as an architect or a soon to be architect, well, fingers crossed soon to be architect, is I look, I would say I would look at the details and then the urban planner looks at the macro scale. So it's all about zooming in and then zooming back, sorry, zooming in is this way, zooming in and then zooming back out. Does that work? Zooming in again, zooming back out. And then that's when the horizontal that Kat mentioned and the vertical of whether do these things work? Do the pedestrians, are they able to flow from one district into another? And what's the pathway? And the nodes, the safe nodes actually that like allow for women to travel from point A to point B, I think is also quite important. So that's my point of view. I've also um, shared a resource in the chat called Queer Spaces, an Atlas of LGBTQ plus places and stories. Uh, which was released by the RIBA, uh, I think maybe two weeks ago, but in the last month. Um, and that's quite an interesting and inspiring resource in terms of looking at the kind of uh, social frameworks that support architecture, both kind of in a formal sense, but also in a kind of more ad hoc sense uh, that supports queer communities. So um, they kind of have everything that editors are uh, an architect and an architectural historian. And yeah, they seem to have kind of a breadth of resources from uh, a gay bar in somewhere in America, straight through to kind of um, housing for queer people in Japan and kind of everything in between. And um, so it's quite an interesting resource and it explores uh, how these communities support each other and uh, how that kind of turns into architecture rather than architecture supporting those spaces specifically. Um, so that might be quite an interesting one to look at as well. I'll just add to that, that because it's so recently published, there are a lot of um, events online and face-to-face -face that Adam, one of the authors is doing and highlighting on his, his Twitter. So um, if you're interested in that book and want to sort of understand a bit more, um, now's the time. Um, they're out there doing a really big book tour, actually. Um, so, yeah, it is it is an incredible resource. Um, I'm hoping that they will do one for the RTPI at some point online, but we'll have to see. They, um, I was actually at one of their 
book launches in Scotland. Um, yeah, and they're really great if you can get along to one of the kind of in-person events, it's great. Sorry, can I just say, I have just read Vanessa's comment and you need to tell your tutor that he needs to read because the politics of toilets are so interesting. And I think it's, it's very interesting that your tutor would say that because the Manchester School of Architecture, we have a whole, um, we have a whole like subject dedicated to the politics of toilets and how um, all inclusive toilets. So like how we, so toilets are gendered as it's always been. And it's always been the males have the urinals and the females don't have the urinals. And actually even this, how, how and how toilets actually designate space for males. So for example, if you go to a stadium, you will definitely, you would see more male toilets than you would see females uh, because it is a male space. So actually toilets indicate whether that is a male owned space or a female owned space. Um, there's so much to talk about toilets. Um, I would um, agree. Yeah, so, and I, it's a very hot topic right now. And I feel I've heard this, like, there's this whole buzz that's happening about toilets and whether like, um, and there's pros and cons, right? So there's one group of people that are saying all excess toilets or all inclusive toilets, that's the term, are like not the best because they don't fit the spec, you know, they take more, uh, they take more dimension. But you have all these um, star architects. I like to call them star architects, especially in Japan. If you really look at them, all these public realm toilets are like very much designer toilets now. So you don't get the like conventional, really icky, gross, cubicle. It's very modern. It's very about like self-washing. It's all about um, the demographic, whether you're willing to pay 30p to go into a really clean toilet or have free toilet amenities even that debate of paying for a toilet is that a right is that is that something that it's a service or is it a right um so yeah there's so much to talk about in toilets and i really really think you should push 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 i would agree so there is a a, a really famous planning academic who writes on women and planning called clara greed who's been writing on toilets uh for about the last 20 years um possibly has some slightly more um, differing views now, but there's definitely a lot of politics and debate around it and it needs to be ha it needs to be discussed more. I mean, I've talked to planners, male planners doing stuff on public toilets before for their dissertation. Um, so I'm very happy to provide you with any sort of um, planning based academic research that's out there that could provide um, a bit of a backing up to it along with what um, Prem has already said as well. There's loads of examples of like, so in London, the, the need to provide public toilets is now um, in the London plan. Um, toilets in most railway stations in London have gone back to being free because they're considered to be so important and it is considered to be a really important public health issue as well as an, an agenda issue so um, it's definitely becoming much more prevalent again but um, Clara Greed is known as the toilet person so you know she's spoken at Women of the World Festival at London South Bank about toilets and you can see it online and stuff so it's out there um and it definitely yeah it's definitely worth a a, 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 a um you're doing what you're saying your thesis for your um ma in architecture yeah continue please yeah. um i was just gonna weigh in on that i know like i don't know if it actually has happened now but at the point when i was doing my like master's last well like last academic year not this one there was a scheme they were talking about in Edinburgh, so it wasn't, a lot of the public toilets had been reduced because it wasn't actually a legal requirement for toilets to be added. But then they were talking about a scheme in which, like, I don't know, the, there's like bars and restaurants and things could sign up to a scheme that said that people could use their toilets in public spaces. Um, I don't know if that actually followed through, I haven't caught up on that recently. Um, but yeah, if anyone actually knows any more about whether that's a thing or not now. Um, and that does sort of, I mean, I know it's almost privatising the issue, but it sort of does provide a lot more because there are also a lot of issues where, you know, if you want to go to the toilet and like, I'd often go to McDonald's or something, so I'm like, this is a huge conglomerate, like it doesn't matter too much if I don't buy something. 
But a lot of places they won't let you in unless you buy a drink or something. I'm like, that's really great, but now I'm going to need the car again. <laughs> so that would be an interesting thing to explore as well, whether that actually would help or whether it does help if it's free to use these public toilets inside of restaurants and bars. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that Clara um, Greed talks about is like the fact that quite a lot of toilets are provided in shopping centres and what happens, say, in somewhere like Milton Keynes, where half of the city centre is like a two mile long shopping centre and then they shut it at night. And so there's suddenly no public toilets and no accessible sort of like space for those things and, and how they are privatised. I think it's really important that Vanessa has just pointed out the community toilet schemes that do exist and yes across England in local authorities having worked for one they have replaced most um, publicly run toilet schemes but I do think it's really interesting that railway stations are starting to make it um, free and it, again um, when it wasn't before they've got rid of the 50p levy but then it's really interesting you see that and then you see Crossrail in London like a huge going to be a massive rail project that you once it's connected runs for miles and miles there are no toilets available on them so like what does somebody that's going all the way from Reading to like the other end of Essex do if they need to go to the toilet in that hour they can't do anything I can see lots of sharing of resources in the chat, Kirsty, but I can't necessarily see any questions. Yeah, I don't think there's any um, anything more major. Um, another question I maybe have would be um, for Kat on kind of related. Um, on kind of how Edinburgh at the moment is getting praised for inclusive design, particularly in terms of transport um, or their ambitions for transport, not necessarily what's been implemented at the moment. And I wondered um, how you thought kind of in hindsight after writing your dissertation, how this was impacting women, if you'd had any thoughts on it at all, um, and also how it would impact Leith, because kind of my understanding is that a lot of the uh, transport kind of um, projects and kind of infrastructure that's been put in place is almost creating more of a um, disconnect between Edinburgh city centre and Leith. And I wondered how that kind of fitted in with the 20 minute neighbourhood concept as well. Um, okay. I'll be honest with you, I'm not living in Edinburgh at the minute, so I'm not quite sure how the tram situation is getting on at the minute. Are we still at a... We're not there. Still, not... <laughs> still at a torn up leaf walk. Because I do know, yeah, I would agree with you, because I think it's a bit of a juxtaposition almost, because they're bringing these trams in to connect leaf better to the city centre and all over the city, but then they're also trying to bring in these 20-minute neighbourhoods. And then for me, I also find it issue with like the sustainable transport and inclusive transport and things. It's really great to bring it in and create better because obviously like by adding, it's like linking people to jobs and things as well, isn't it? Like I don't know whether people are going back into offices. But I also found an issue is like how you get to the bus stop and how you get back to the bus stop as well from your house after dark and things. Like I know for me, like where I used to live, it was either I walk a long route around the park or I go through a dark little alleyway behind a dodgy looking building to get onto Leaf Walk. And I think that's the thing that needs to be considered. Like, yeah, you might make your buses more inclusive and safer night buses and things. But yeah, it's how are you going to get to and from the bus stops as well? And I think that also just links back to like, it's the same with the services, like if the bus stops are where bus stops are located and things as well like whether they're on night streets, because I know there's like issues with some of them in the city centre and then like a lot of the city centre around like the historic site isn't super busy at night as much because that's more like a tourist zone, not the place where the bars and clubs are and things that people go to. If that answers your question, okay. I think that's just really interesting because that really just circle backs to going from my macro to micro, macro to micro, right? It's like, as a developer, we're like, okay, we'll put a bus stop here because especially if you look at like the 15 minute walking plan, right, of like efficient transportation, 
but then that's purely on we have x amount of buses we have x amount of demographics and we need to get this x of demographics with this amount of buses to get to that amount of places so that's how they mark the bus stops and then i feel like as as, as feminist urban planners feminist architects this is when we really look at the details being exactly what you're trying to say of like that alleyway is dark that's not going to work what if you turn that into a public realm where there is um what's the word public security where or passive secure or passive surveillance where you know that for example in manchester in Oc i would be more than glad to walk on oxford road on any time of the night but on princess street like there are certain times of the day where i don't feel safe walking at even as a male like i don't feel safe walking at so um that's it it's like macro micro 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 and then it's the cross of professions i feel are really important yeah i think on that um that note we might call it a night i think um thanks everyone for an amazing discussion and um to the speakers or who we have left that hasn't had to dip out um for great presentations the event will be uh, released on youtube at some point in the future and we'll kind of send that out or post on social media um and we'll hopefully get the presentation circulated as well so thanks everyone yeah and just to say there will be more in the series um in due course and to look out for other things and if anybody wants to do anything wants to speak about something let us know and we're always happy to facilitate that thank you very much again